creatives, community, kind folks out there, hello, welcome to RPG with DBJ. I am your host, DBJ. This is a special, uh, um, special short video, um, Survival Saturday. I thought I'd just try to do something a little bit different and uh, give people what they want. Normally, we go an hour live in a live stream. Uh, unable to do that, so I thought I'd do some videos here for Saturday and Sunday for those who may miss out on the longer talks that we have together. So today, I thought I'd bring up something that uh, comes up relatively uh, normally when we talk about Dungeons and & Dragons and running survival games, and that is, how do you run a survival game when you have spells like Good Berry, Create Food and Water, um, and the tiny hut, Lemon's tiny hut spell. How do you do that? So I thought I'd I thought I'd be silly, have some fun, and talk about some problem issues with it. And if you really want to try to run a more gritty game, but still allow players to pick those spells, uh, here are some ideas. And and uh, none of them are none of them are are uh, easy or simple to do. But again, we're just going to have some fun and just uh, talk about this generally. Now I will say that session zero we if you're a new player i'm sure you get online you type in session zero when it comes to tabletop rpg games the idea is if you're going to run a survival game and your players agree to run a survival game maybe you want to limit or even completely negate a ton of these spells that basically are easy buttons that help you survive otherwise it's not very much survival right so coming up with ways where maybe there are uh, they are of a higher spell level. Maybe you add three to five spell levels to this ability. Maybe it's not available at all. Maybe it's very rare. So yes, you can agree to negate damn near anything you want at your own table. There are no RPG police uh, that I know of. So um, again, so that being said, if you want to allow your players by the normal rules to pick those things, but you still want to run a, a survivalist, grittier type of game. Here's some ideas. So let's let's go into Goodberry. So Goodberry is a first level transmutation. Uh, takes an action, range touch, which is kind of negligible. Basically, it's in the hand, but it has um, material components: verbal, somatic, and a material component, which is going to be important. It's available to the druid and the ranger, and it says up to ten berries appear in your hand and are infused with magic for the duration. A creature can use its action to eat one berry. Eating a berry restores one hit point, and the berry provides enough nourishment to sustain a creature for one day. The berries lose their potency if they have not been consumed within 24 hours of the casting of the spell, which pretty much means like you can, for 24 hours at least, minimum, you can put them in your pocket, you can pop one in your mouth, it gives you enough nourishment. Uh, I believe that under sage advice that they mentioned that nourishment does not include water. So it includes the food nourishment, the nutrients that you need, but not the water uh, nourishment. But if you're a ranger or druid, you could probably very quite easily find a water source unless you're in a place where it's very harsh, like a desert or some other um, arcane area. Now, there are a couple of things that you want to you want to point out as a dungeon master. And if your players are willing to understand that you're trying to make this far more difficult to survive. So uh, the main thing is, the, let's go with the verbal and somatic components, all right? In your game, if you're using a, a method where players uh, uh, become, they're unable to speak, they're sick, they become ill, maybe they're in a swamp, they're, they're choking, what have you, if they're unable to vo vocalize, then those spells that have are difficult to vocalize might be an issue. Now, that's going to be very rare, especially considering that this is probably a spell that's going to be done for the most part outside of combat. Although, it, it, of course, it takes one action. You can do it in combat and toss people a couple of your berries. But again, being able to vocalize. The other one is somatic components. Someone with a broken hand, they're not able to use their fingers or whatnot. Now, if they have one hand available, again. Yes, you can absolutely uh, perform the spell, especially out of combat with some healing, some restoration. Of course, that's uh, that's um, also available. But if you are running a far more gritty game, you still want them to have access to the spell. But you also maybe have a random table or certain things that happen. Players lose so many hit points uh, by a certain level or if a crit critical is hit and their hands are affected or their ability to vocalize, that's a problem. But that's going to be a very rare situation or one that's pretty easy to alleviate. But here's the main thing. Material component-wise, it requires a sprig of mistletoe. Now, 
if you're like me, a lot of times we tend to uh, not ignore the the components of a spell, but but allow them to be reskinned. So maybe a forest ranger or druid might be different than a winter ranger or druid versus a desert ranger or druid, whatnot. So you may you may want to change the mistletoe to something more thematic for that particular character and what region they come from. But the important part is, does the player have enough mistletoe for them to supply themselves with enough good berries to extend them days, weeks, months, years through a region that they're not prepared for. So for example, uh, a forest ranger or druid that goes into the deep wilderness, um, deep wilderness, geez, uh, deep cold or desert region may not have access to mistletoe. And so if they say, oh no, I've got 10, I've got 10 sprigs of mistletoe with me. Although some players might, might claim, well, it doesn't weigh much. I've got 200 sprigs, but you're going to have to solve that at your own table. But again, if they've got 10 sprigs, they've got 10 uses of the spell. After that, they're going to have to find a place. Maybe they're, this is a, um, a good opportunity to have a fetch quest to have them find someone, another ranger or druid that lives in this region that has access to mistletoe, or befriend another druid or um, druid, druidic circle, or meet another survivalist, another ranger that lives in the area that gives them another material component that equals the use of the mistletoe in the first place. Now, here's another thing that's important when uh, talking about the good berry. It says uh, up to 10 berries, berries appear in your hand and are infused with magic for the duration, which is up to 24 hours. So beings that can detect magic or are sensitive to magic, or if you go into an area of dispel or anti-magic, the berries lose their effectiveness. I would, I would say and mind you, this is GM um, adjudication here, that a good berry put into an area of non-magic completely loses its magic, moved from that area. So an example would be you go into an anti-magic or you're blasted by uh, a beholder and you're under its anti-magic central eye that it loses its potency and then it loses its potency completely. Now, mind you, it's a first level spell. It could be recast later on, but when the player goes to reach into their pocket to throw someone a berry or the fighter who's carrying the berries around with them, given to them by the ranger or the druid, reaches in and finds out that it's just a, a bitter tasting berry. It's now a raisin. It's no longer a grape. They might be surprised by that. So I would talk about that a little bit, metagame it a little bit like, hey, we're doing something that's a little bit, again, a little more um, gritty, little, try to get a little bit more realistic. We want this to be a little bit of a harsher survivalist, but I don't want to take away your abilities. So that's the thing. Um, also, uh, getting a little bit of narrative on this, and uh, uh, forgive me if I'm getting a little bit sensitive on this situation, but there's also the idea of, you know, um, garbage in, garbage out, right? Hey, listen, you eat enough ghost peppers, I don't know about you, but I eat enough uh, hot wings, it's ass fuel coming out the back end, right? Asparagus, and you might, you, you start to, to smell. So, being silly and being a little bit um <laughs> being a little bit dirty here, it's possible that eating too many good berries might actually leave a trail that some predators uh or prey might be able to find and smell their way towards the party as they as they crap and urinate in the corners on their three week journey into the wilderness. So the ranger and druid might be quite aware, like, hey, well, we don't want to live off of them because they they draw predators, maybe draw um more of the aberrant style predators like um like uh, owl bears and griffins and manticores and uh chimera that live in the far outskirts that smell this stuff and go hunting for it now when it comes to again i brought up the fact that good berries uh, are infused with magic for the duration there may be enemies that have spies out there or a shrine for magic or glow when something is revealed as magic, especially if they come into a very metropolitan city with uh, people at the guard towers or uh, proctors or some kind of a, um, members of the guard that walk around looking for magic or errant magic or even um, controlled by a magiocracy or magi magiocracy uh, where they have agents that 
that detect magic, especially if they've agreed to come into a city or a protectorate where magic is not supposed to be available. There may be also uh, alarms set when magic comes into an area. So if someone walks into a uh, a craft shop and there's magical alarms, if someone tries to cast like a mage hand to steal something, these berries may set off the magical alarm as well. So it, it's not a it's not a, a a DM. Hey, I know exactly how to stop this thing. But again. Narratively wise, Goodberry, while um, while a great first level ability to have your players survive without having to hunt for food and whatnot, may also be a thing that can work against them. Also, there may be predators or prey that may love themselves some Goodberries. For example, there may be uh, deer or uh, some kind of um, uh, uh, animals, uh, squirrels or uh, tree monkeys or whatever that love Goodberries. They may cause some problems for the party, not necessarily a an enemy, but they may into the encampment and steal the good berries for themselves because they taste so good. And that in and of itself, they may be followed by a herd of these animals and then prey may then track them following those animals. So for example, the, the players are going through the desert. They use the good berries because there's no place to find, you know, they're still trying to find some water and go to an oasis, but at least they have food with them with these good berries. And there may be uh, trapped or spiders or something that love the good berries, and so or scorpions or something that that crawl over the party or follow the party whenever they try to make camp, and then maybe there's boulets, uh, bullets, uh, land sharks that that hunt after these uh, you know spiders or scorpions that eat them, and then of course that means it's drawing to the party. So that could be a hazard as well that you can set up or foreshadow for the players, especially when they make their nature or survival checks. Now let's go on to create food and water because I'm, I'm going. Pr- Tried to make this short, but we're going pretty long here. Um, uh, creating food and water is a third level conjuration, takes one action, it has a range of 30 feet, so you don't actually have to create the food in, um, in front of you, you can create far away. But it says uh, it's for clerics and paladins, can create 45 pounds of food and 30 gallons of water on the ground or in containers within range, enough to sustain up to 15 humanoids or five steeds for 24 hours. The food is bland but nourishing and spoils if uneaten after 24 hours. The water is clean and doesn't go bad. Now, again, this is a third level spell, far higher than the first level Goodberry spell. Pretty powerful. Allows you to basically sustain an army (laughs) of sorts or at least a a, a, a sizable number of individuals. 15 humanoids and five um, and or five steeds. I mean, any combination thereof, that's a pretty sizable group of people, bodyguards, uh, bandits, what have you. Now, again, this the components for this are only verbal and somatic. I mentioned verbal and somatic components being a problem, but you're not going to have that problem, especially by third level. Now, it does create 45 pounds of food and 30 gallons of water, which if unless you consume it in one sitting, you're going to have to pack it onto animals or somehow put it in containers. Um, in backpacks, I'm sure that because it's magical and it's third level, that the water doesn't spill on the ground, that it, it fills whatever containers you have uh, available, and the food as well is probably not just going to spoil into the mud, that it, of course, is, um, you, you could cast it and have it land in something that can hold it. And so maybe the players are eating it um, on their travels. Again, predators and or prey may smell the food. Like it says the food is bland, but nourishing. So it's possible that now it does not say that the food kill. So creating food water may be need, need to cast multiple times a day, three meals a day, create a uh, food and water, third level spell three times during that day. So that means it can su- supply for one of those meals, but maybe not all of them. Um, Again, adjudicating it, you could say, you could also make the the argument that it is a third level spell. The fact that it's nourishing and it's above the level of a good berry that, yeah, it does supply the food for all day. Not a problem. I wouldn't, I wouldn't argue against it. Um, And, uh, but it does say it spoils if uneaten after 24 hours, which again, since it creates 45 pounds of food and there may only be three individuals, you may have to leave rotted food behind in order to, when casting spell, it doesn't say you get to choose. So 
you may leave rotted food behind you, which may lead you may lead a trail that others can follow. Of course, clerics and paladins are not really the the survivalist type, but the druid the, the druids and rangers that are like, listen, we might want to come mix and match our our good berries and uh, create food and water. Now, of course, it says it's bland, and we and there are many of threads that talk about many threads that talk about good berries not being able. It gives you the nourishment, but it doesn't sate sate your hunger or food a little bit, making it warm, giving it some spices, changing the flavor and the texture just a little bit so it's far more nourishing. That's a possibility as well. But again, you may have um, uh, other individuals who are able to sense magic and understand where that food and water came from. It doesn't, ne it, now the spell doesn't say that after the food and water is created, that in and of itself it is magic, but I would, I would suggest to you that like the ranger and druid creating a good berry, that it would be thematic to where they've come from. So if they've come from, say, a far Arctic region, they may make fish or shellfish or something, uh, blubber or what have you. Maybe they come from a coastal area and they make um, fish or lobster or a, a crab or whatever, a seaweed or what have you. I mean, the, I would say that it 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 very much fits within the theme thematic or narrative method that the food and water created, not the water, but the food created would be a thematically related to the cleric or paladin's background, religion, oath, the location they came from. Um, in our own world, we have people that have uh, spicy foods or peanut oils or olive oils or or um, certain types of peppers and salts and sage and things. And so those things might be part of the food, even if it says it's bland, that food may be pasta versus potatoes versus rice versus some kind of other kind of oats or gruel. And so someone may be able to detect that um, an outsider or wherever they're going to, maybe the players are outsiders and soldiers may find that this food comes from a particular region and discover maybe not the PCs themselves, but that there are um, intruders or raiders from maybe an enemy faction or a continent or culture that's coming into the region. Also, uh, the food created may, again, lead a prey uh, creatures that are not, they don't want to be violent um, or aggressive towards the player characters, but they may want to eat the food. You know, the, the errant bear or tree squirrel or raccoon that wants to get some of the food and keep it for themselves and take it back to their nest. Uh, while cute at some point, they may change their behavior, um, as well as the fact that that narratively, when the cleric or paladin summons this food, where does it come from? Why is it gifted to them? Maybe the, the gods or agents of the gods might want to know how this food is being used, not have it wasted. So the players may be um, warned not to waste 45 pounds of food for three PCs that are going to just dump the stuff in the woods. They may say, hey, you need to spread that food towards uh, others, especially if you're playing like a cleric or paladin. Uh, slash warlock combination, maybe the to other people. But again, that's just a narrative thing. Uh, you don't necessarily have to use it, but but of course, it, we're, you want to start a uh, a a gritty, more survivalist game. So you may want to pull those threads and your players session zero whatnot uh, agree to it. Okay. So lastly, we've come upon we've come upon the tiny hut or or better known classically as Leoman's Tiny Hut uh, because there are many Leoman style spells. And this one's a powerful one, but again, it's not all perfect. So this is again, a third level spell. But when you when you read the effects, it's pretty powerful. So it only takes a minute to cast. It is a ritual uh, pretty much done out of combat. Uh, it, the range is self 10 foot radius hemisphere. So imagine I'm, I'm, I'm in my mind, I'm picturing a dome that's flat on the bottom, although it could, I guess it, it does say hemisphere, so it doesn't say a cylinder, but uh, that's not really important. But the components are, of course, verbal, somatic, and material, a small crystal bead. Again, tracking material components. How many crystal beads do they have? Can they pick up another crystal bead? Maybe they find crystal beads with, with others, that kind of thing, depending on where they go. So the duration is eight hours. So it's basically a uh, like a magical tent of sorts. Uh, the classes that have it are bard and wizard, of course. And here, here are the details. A 10-foot radius immobile dome, pay attention to that, to that immobile portion, of force springs into existence around and above you and remains stationary for the duration. That's important as well. The spell ends if you leave its area. 
nine creatures of medium size or smaller can fit inside the dome with you. So that's important as well. The spell fails if its area includes a large creature, larger creature, or more than nine creatures. So large creatures, a larger creature like a horse or a mount or something like that would not be able to fit inside. You may need to leave your mounts outside of it. Creatures and objects within the dome, when you cast a spell, can move through it freely. All other creatures and objects are barred from passing through it. Spells and other magical effects can't extend through the dome or be cast through it. That's pretty powerful. The atmosphere inside the space is comfortable and dry regardless of the weather outside. Until the spell ends, you can command the interior to become dimly lit or dark. The dome is opaque from the outside of any color you choose, but it is transparent from the inside. So the, 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 the most powerful thing that people hear about this is spells and other magical effects can't extend through the dome or be cast through it. So it sounds like, hey, someone casts a fireball from the outside once you're... But people on the player characters, the, not the, the person who cast it, but the other people inside, your other party members, can walk through the wall, attack enemies, maybe run back into it, that kind of thing. And the fact that it lasts eight hours seems like it's overpowered. Now, there are some limitations. For example, talking about the crystal bead, how many crystal beads do you have? Can you get more crystal beads? Has someone stolen a crystal beads from you? Whatever. And of course, it's used up in the casting of it. But the other thing that you can you can play with as a dungeon master to give this spell a little bit of a hazard is the fact is the fact that uh, it's only ten feet and it remains stationary for the duration. Now, I would wonder or adjudicate if you cast this on ground that becomes moist, it soaks. Can you cast Lehman's tiny hut on a on a sailing ship tossed at sea? Does it move with the ship or does it remain in its place and the ship move? Further, if you cast this in a desert during a sandstorm, uh, if the sand shifts from under it, does it float or does it fall down with the sand? If not, does it get covered with, with the weather outside? So remember, when a Lehman's Tiny Hut is cast, it, of course, is definitely a magical effect, although maybe certain types of predators won't understand that it's magical. They'll just see this colored dome of force, but they could crawl over top of it. Uh, creature uh, Enemies that have can sense magic, will know what it is. Other wizards that are probably third level, can cast third level wizards or bards that cast third level spells or higher, are probably going to immediately recognize what a tiny hut is from a distance and uh, react accordingly. Other dangers can uh, can uh, come about this. Forest fires can surround you. Uh, floodwaters, uh, earthquakes, sandstorms, um, uh, being covered with debris, either by accident or on purpose. Enemies have now upwards of eight hours that if PCs remain in or anyone remains inside the tiny hut to prepare themselves. Uh, since it doesn't move, there may be given an eight hour duration for the enemy to collect themselves together. If, if the PCs try to rest inside of a dungeon, there may be other creatures that might try to surround uh, surround the thing, either questioning what it is, uh, trying to attack it. And, any number of uh, hazardous effects could happen on the outside happening to the PCs after eight hours, whether it's being um, being underwater, uh, being surrounded by acid, having um, dangerous things put up against the Lehman's tiny hut, um, having the place covered from the inside. But if it's covered over with tarps or dirt or mud or snow, they won't be able to see outside unless they exit it. Now, of course, it's it's uh, comfortable and dry inside, but it's only 10 feet, 10 foot radius. So it, it's not a place that you can quite live in. It's more of a tent than a home. Being up, Having up to nine other individuals inside of a 10 foot tent, no matter how powerful it is and, and how much of a, a spellcaster you are, uh, can be pretty nasty. Now, of course, uh, food can be created in there. You can rest, you can recuperate. Uh, your waste could probably be released because objects can be pushed through the other side. Um, cause it says creatures and objects within a dome when you cast a spell can move through it freely. Um, so again, maybe if you're on the inside of it, you could launch attacks from the outside if they're physical. So, it says creatures and objects, so maybe someone can fire an arrow, and you may be able to kill one or more opponents that are on the outside, but after a while, it, you know, only so many arrows can be fired till, sorry about that, guys, until the, the enemy finds out what the hell's going on. Now, of course, 
the the any kind of adversary or enemy that's on the outside can can pretty much run for it, right? But because the the dome remains stationary, there may be many things that move around it. Uh, someone can build and push an army around it, or build a wall around it, or cast their own spells that do not affect the dome directly, but could create a wall of force around the dome or a wall of stone or fire or what have you, or create their own Lehman's tiny hut or tiny hut spell outside of your tiny hut spell waiting for you to exit or waiting for your duration to end. And of course you could stack a don't stack a hut, right? You could have a, have a hut end and immediately cast another one because it is an eight hour duration. And by that time you've already gotten your spell slots. Uh, back, but you couldn't quite live in it forever because the rest of the world can just move on. But anyway, uh, oh, and narratively, based on the color of the spell, it's possible that that thematically, certain people from certain areas or certain spellcasters or wizard schools may have a tiny hut that is of a certain color or pattern on the outside, and that might be recognized. There may be certain schools that teach the spell, and those that teach the spell, they may, they may know. Uh, the students who have learned that spell based on how rare or how popular uh, the spell, the, the spell casting is for narrative um, ability, as well as the fact that um, needing crystal beads, the minute someone asks or tries to hunt for or find crystal beads may give a clue to that region. Oh, this person wanted to purchase some cheap crystal bead for, for eight copper pieces, but then they alert the town's guard that, oh, this person has this spell. We need to watch out for them or at least prepare ourselves because they may get in some trouble. And if we see a tiny hut out there, we know who it is that purchased the beads and know what they're capable of, capable of or even their name. Of course, you can have individuals try to parlay through the tiny hut and um, ask for them to give up, give themselves up or exit the tiny hut. And remember, the person who cast it cannot leave the tiny hut because it's dispelled. So the other players can run out of it. Of course, you can always have the, the wizard or the bard. Maybe the bard is the person that heals everyone. The players can run back into the tiny hut to get healed and run back out of it, uh, which I'm sure is used uh, quite often uh, to, to exit. Or create some situation where they're the only ones that can solve the situation before then, again, casting it. Um, casting the dome. Now, uh, uh, the adjudication portion of it, when it says it immobile or uh, remains stationary if on a sailing ship, uh, if you cast it on in a swamp, does it sink down into the water? Can you cast it? Does it float in the air? It doesn't say anything about that. So you'd have to agree moves up or down. Now, of course, if it moves, it still has the protective properties, right? I would still include the protective properties. No one inside is injured or hurt, even if it falls down, sinks down into a swamp or is, uh, you know, covered by floodwaters. But you do have the 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 dangers of debris. Maybe a, an abandoned castle falls in on them, uh, or <laughs> something like that. A dead creature is killed and falls on top of the on top of the hut, or uh, a, a gelatinous cube tries to get rid of the hut and swarms over top of the hut, trying to you know, mindlessly trying to, uh, to eat it and, uh, you know, nothing happens. Maybe even a, even a, uh, a pack of rust monsters smell some, 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 ele some metal items left outside of the hut and they circle around looking for some food. I mean, you can create some uh, hilarious things as well. So anyway, just wanted to come up with some ideas to, to mess with that. I know we've gone about a half an hour uh, with this, but thank you very much if you've uh, partaken of this. I'm DBJ. Thank you very much. There's some some links here beside my face. A link on them if you want to see some other videos or like, share, subscribe, that kind of thing. So anyway, see you tomorrow.